Welcome everyone to this evening's webinar sponsored by the Epilepsy Foundation New England. I'm so pleased to introduce you to our speaker this evening, Dr. Mark Richardson. Dr. Richardson is an associate professor of neurosurgery at Harvard Medical School, and he's the director of the functional neurosurgery at Massachusetts General Hospital, where he leads the epilepsy surgery program. Dr. Richardson is well known for his commitment to helping patients understand and access modern and comprehensive epilepsy care. And I am pleased to have you here. Dr. Richardson has indicated that he's willing to take questions during the program. And while you are all currently muted, there is a point where he's gonna ask for some feedback from the audience. I will unmute you all. And then after that section is over, you will be muted once again. So thank you and welcome. If you've never done a webinar before, there is a question panel where you can type questions in there and I'll monitor it. If you're having any issues, you can type a message to me in the chat window. Um, I think I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Susan Wel Welby, Director of Education at the Epilepsy Foundation New England. So welcome all. Dr. Richardson, please take it away. Great, thank you, Susan, um, and thanks so much for the invitation to um, present on DBS, which is Deep Brain Simulation for Epilepsy. Um, really do want this to be interactive, so if anyone has a question, um, they can enter it um, in the chat box or you know, otherwise indicate um, that you have a question and we'll, we can take, that, take those as we go. Um, all right, so I think everyone can see the screen here and can see me. So. Um, Many of you um, will already know this, um, but 30 to 40% of people with epilepsy um, have uncontrolled seizures, so, so uh, drug-resistant epilepsy, or, or DRE. Um, and this is a large percent of people uh, with seizures, um, obviously. So um, let me just start out by saying some of this information uh, I pulled from some slides um, from Medtronic. Most of it I prepared myself, but some of it that has this type of coloring is done by um, some Medtronic slides I grabbed some information from. Um, I'm not compensated for this um, type of work. I do receive some um, consulting uh, compensation from uh, companies that make neuromodulatory devices, um, as many kind of experts do, but this is um, not compensated talk. Uh, to be clear. So um, let's talk about this. What does drug refractory epilepsy really mean? Um, this is this definition has been established by the International League Against Epilepsy. And you, you may or may not be surprised at this point to know that it's just um, the failure of two well-tolerated uh, and what's called appropriately chosen, chosen medications um, to um, not control to, to not control seizures. So basically, that's just trying two medications um, that don't work uh, to stop seizures completely. Um, there are other terms that you know physicians use: uncontrolled, intractable, resistant, pharmacoresistant. Um, all these essentially mean the same thing. And I will say, you know, many of you, you know, or your family members, if you're tuning in for them. Um, may have at times had a physician say, well, it seems the epilepsy is controlled, it seems like seizures are controlled, or you may have even say, said, you know, that seem, seizures are really controlled now, but the true definition of control means no seizures. All right, so um, why is this such an issue? Um, this is what the seizure um, freedom rates look like after trying a first. So AED is anti-epileptic medication. Um, someone who has um, an epilepsy, as many of you know, uh, is the state of having had two seizures that are not explained by a specific event that can be fixed. Um, so once you've had two, that's epilepsy. And then People are started on a medication. At that time, not quite half of people might be seizure free. When you add a second medication, you only get about 13% more who are, who are seizure free at that point. Um, so you still got at least 40% of people who, whose seizures are not controlled. By adding a third medication, 
you only add about one more percent of people. And then when you get into polytherapy, which is, you know, really kind of mixing around and getting on a bunch of medications, um, you can at most bump about three more percent people into the controlled category. Um, so you have at least 30% uh, of people who are really under, uh, really uncontrolled um, in terms of medical management. So again, a lot of people. And then when you factor in, you know, something that patients talk to me about a lot is, um, not just the control of seizures in terms of whether or not uh, the seizures have stopped, but the side effects of medication um, obviously can be a really big deal. And some of the trade-offs to get so-called control of the epilepsy um, can really be um, significant in terms of what that can do to reduce quality of life. So um, epilepsy programs um, and certainly epilepsy surgery programs exist to um, try to do something about this problem. Um, which means figuring out ways to improve people's quality of life when medication hasn't worked. And of course, if medication does work, we, we always want to do that before we have to physically do something to the brain. Um, but there are cases where um, we have the potential to really cure someone's epilepsy um, or drastically reduce the amount of seizures. Now, um, despite that, um, epilepsy surgery is vastly underutilized, so it's thought that um, less than 15% even of people who would be a candidate for epilepsy surgery, that means they would qualify for some type of epilepsy surgery, a uh, vast majority of people um, don't get surgery. So why is that? Um, and why is this? You know, the average time from diagnosis to referral for surgery is um, at least 18 years. And there was a study done at um, UCLA, uh, which at one point had a you know, very busy epilepsy surgery program. And they looked at their data from a point where the American Academy of Neurology came out with a new guideline for when people should be referred uh, for epilepsy surgery. Um, and they compared the time it took people to reach um, a recommendation for surgery and to, to get referred to talk to a surgeon. Um, before and after this national guideline was released. Um, and the average time to get to surgery before was 18 years. The average time after was still 18 years. So um, I think really all of, uh, all of us on the physician side who um, try to help people with epilepsy are clearly doing something you know, wrong in terms of getting the message out or making the therapy available. So this is actually the first question I had. If anyone wants to chime in here about why they think epilepsy surgery may be so underutilized, I would love to hear um, any ideas. You can type them in and send them to Susan, or you can um, raise your hand and, um, and speak to the group. It's fine with me if anyone would like to give an opinion here. I'll try unmuting all and see if that works. If it's too news noisy, I'll mute them all again. <laughs> Let me see, do I see a hand raised? Anybody have any ideas? I, I have a theory. I mean, I think, but one, I think brain, the thought of brain surgery is scary. And I think that's probably the number one reason, or I would guess it to be. I think insurance. Good one. Say unmute Liz. Unmute this one, okay. Uh, let me see. Liz Malouf, you're unmuted. Did you have a comment? Liz? Yeah. Okay, I think Kimberly's the one that said insurance. Liz, I'm sorry, we're unable to hear you even though I unmuted you. Let me see who else has a hand raised. What, oh, Patrick Beeler? Patrick, you're unmuted. Yeah, hey, Susan, how are you? I'm good, Patrick. Do you have a comment for Dr. Richardson? Well, I think, well, I've had two AMTLs in my life. The first one, they weren't aggressive enough. They didn't get enough of the hippocampus or the temporal lobe. And like you said, the average is 18 years. My second one was 18 years after the first one. 
And oh. they removed pretty much the rest of the hippocampus. And I think the biggest thing for me when I was thinking about having it again was I made it through the first time without really having any side effects. What I was lucky the second time, thinking back, I should have taken the risk far before. Like, that's what I would want people to know, that not having seizures, depending where the seizures are coming from, like, if it's coming from your frontal lobe, that's a different story. Mine were coming from my temporal lobe. For me, that risk was totally worth it, and that's what I would want people to realize, that it's not living your life without seizures is completely different than living with them. Thank you, Patrick. Patrick, can you go ahead and mute yourself? And I'm going to, somebody else has their hand raised. Shanda Lynn, you are unmuted. Hey, Susan, can you hear me? I can, Shanda, go ahead. How exciting. Um, I think that you and I were both in the same. Um, we had a, we had a pharma company that performed surgery, surgery for a medical device who literally I asked very challenging questions to because that's the kind of person I am and they told us that medication is a gold standard the pharmaceutical company who produces the medical device that's surgically implanted um, because I am a patient with refractory epilepsy who was a candidate for surgery and continue to be a candidate for surgery and um, for a surgery and I asked them and they, and Susan, do you remember this? Um, I, I don't, Shanda, I apologize. I don't remember this, but it's, it's fascinating to me. Please continue. I, I said, I feel like I shouldn't be like calling people out or calling um, mm -hmm. pharma companies out. I don't even know if they're a pharma company out, but they came as, as pharma companies frequently do come to the Epilepsy Foundation to educate us on their devices or their medications so that we are up to date on things. Um, and they said, and I said, why, why, why wouldn't this be a first? Why? Medications make me miserable. I'm miserable. I have this, I have that. Everyone has this, they, ha they have that. Why wouldn't this be a first option if you're telling me that these other statistics are that some of the side effects instead are increased mood and it's being used for refractory depression and it's being used for PTSD with the VA. Um, the FDA approved it for this. Um, this is a, this is not the DBS. This is something else, but just talking about surgery in general and, and, and this company that produces the medical device said medication is a gold standard. Um, so if you're talking about culture in general. Could be, could be culture. There's another comment here, Dr. Richardson, that um, the uh, Karen Sweet says surgery is not available for me because imaging is unable to locate the locus of the seizure origin. Do you want to speak to that a little bit? Oh, are you muted? Let me see. Oh my goodness. I didn't realize I muted you, Dr. Richard Olson. I'm sorry. You're <laughs> You're okay, unmuted no now. <laughs> I would say all, all of these points are so good. I'm going to hit each of them as we go forward. Um, anyone else waiting to make a comment? I do not see any more hands raised, and I'm keeping great. an eye on the question window. But thank you, Patrick and Kim and Shanda and Karen and Liz. I heard that you have no sound. I apologize. So if you use the question panel, or the chat window for anything you want to add to the discussion, I'll monitor it for you. That's right. Who was the who was the last person, Susan, who talked about uh, uh, imaging negative epilepsy? Who's who was that? Okay, sorry, I closed the question window. Now I got to open it again. Hang on a second. That's okay. I'll remember the question. I think it was. That's okay. I've, I've made a note to, to address that specific point. Okay, and there is another question. Is deep brain stimulation good for Lennox-Gastaut syndrome? Gosh, this is 
We're getting loaded with good questions here. Yep. Uh, Karen Sweet asked the question about imaging not being um, enough to locate the origin of the seizure. Got it. Okay. okay. Okay, this is fantastic because this helps to um, helps to make sure that I cover some of the, these issues as we go forward, which I think I've got. Okay, all right, so we talked about this. All right, so here's something I think is very important to um, recognize. The goal of epilepsy surgery is to stop, if we can, the seizures. Um, but if we can do that, and sometimes we know ahead of time we're not going to stop them with surgery. Excuse me. Um, we want to significantly reduce the seizures because the more we can do that, um, the more time the brain spends in a normal state as opposed to having a seizure, about to having a seizure, about to have a seizure, recovering from a seizure. The success in doing that is dependent upon identifying, and what we used to say in epilepsy surgery, it was dependent upon identifying the spot you know, where seizure started. But related to two of these questions, the thinking has really evolved here. And so a modern approach to thinking about epilepsy thinks not about, well, where's the one spot where these are starting? Because some people have seizures that don't start in one spot. It's to think about the network and what is the circuit um, abnormality that we could potentially treat. So that relates to the question that um, Karen had about MRI negative um, uh, uh, epilepsy. And, this is a myth that people who do not have a spot or lesion that can be seen on the MRI are not candidates for surgery. Anyone basically who is drug resistant is a candidate for surgery because we have so many options now, which we'll talk about. Um, and this also relates to the question about Lennox Gastaut or other types of generalized epilepsy. And I will say that treatment with devices um, are that's off label it's not fda approved but there are many of us and i'm one of them who believes that these devices can work very well for for generalized epilepsy and lennox gastaut um, but the caveat is that that is that is not proven by randomized controlled trials uh, but we'll talk about this a little more okay so, we've so there's one more question from casey clark about would this work with someone with a vns already in Yes, we will talk about that too. Okay. Uh, you can note for that. Two people asked that. Two people asked about the VNS. Yeah, and, another, yeah. and then another question along the lines of the LGS is they were told that their daughter's seizures were generalized mm -hmm. and that a corpus callosotomy would be our best option. Um, um, let me just tackle that one um, straight on. Um, so this is common depends on the type of epilepsy so corpus callosotomy works best for one specific component of generalized epilepsy which is atonic seizures so that means atonic means no movement it's drop attack so corpus callosotomy can work very well for people who have generalized seizures of which many of their seizures are drop attacks um, and these are people often they're going to the emergency room. Sometimes they have to wear helmets. Um, and so neuromodulation, um, DBS can, it's not clear the extent to which that will work for drop attack. So for instance, in some cases we've recommended um, the potential of doing both the corpus callosotomy to cover the drop attack and then potentially coming back with DBS to modulate the rest of the circuit because again, we're not thinking about the one spot, one place we can intervene. We're thinking about how to control the, the circuit that's abnormal. Um, okay. All right. So, I have one last comment. Once somebody put in that this was one of your barriers to surgery, fear yes. of post-surgery personality change or change in mental ability. So if you add that, and then I'll let you go on. <laughs> okay, these are such great questions. This is why it's a good, it's a good idea, I think, to ask, um, ask questions. Um, okay, so this will bring us back to Patrick's comments. So Patrick has said, and thank you so much for volunteering uh, your experience, Patrick, because this is very valuable for people to hear. So Patrick's had two temporal lobe surgeries. It sounds like he is seizure free now, or at least you know pretty mm -hmm. close to that. Um, and 
and I'm going to show you a picture of what a temporal lobectomy looks like in a minute, just kind of a cartoon of this, but um, that's a scary surgery for people to think about. And I think Patrick helped us to answer um, one way to look at that in terms of fear of surgery and fear of personality change, which is that it is possible that you can have a personality or cognitive change that is quite significant after an epilepsy surgery. But in the right hands, um, the risk of that happening should be very low, even with what people would think of as our scariest types of surgeries where we're removing the front part of the temporal lobe or we're operating in the frontal lobe. So um, I think Patrick's message is one of the most important, which is that once um, one finds out that uh, they're a, a candidate for surgery, um, if things align, um, it is better to do something earlier uh, than to wait. And the reason is because the chance of a complication from surgery is actually much lower than the cumulative effects of having seizures um, that aren't controlled by medication over someone's life ongoing. When you look at the risk of SUDEP, just sudden unexplained death and epilepsy, having to go back to the emergency room, um, not being able to work and drive, et cetera. Um, so yeah, so we'll, we'll talk about that a little more. Okay, so let's talk about clinical management of epilepsy. And even though the, so we are gonna get to DBS, um, but before we get there, it's important to understand how someone would make it to that type of recommendation. So let's talk about clinical management of epilepsy and how someone is evaluated for their potential candidacy for surgery. Um, and if anyone um, is listening or you know, for a family member and, and has not had this type of comprehensive workup, it's just critical that you um, land in a center that can do this um, before you really know uh, the best type of treatment um, for your particular epilepsy. So anyone that's having seizures that occur on medication or um, anyone who's had seizure and is on seizure medications and has a finding on the MRI. Um, so one thing that can happen is someone can have a lesion, let's say, in a part of the brain that someone has looked at that and said, oh, it's not safe to do anything surgically there. We're going to keep you on medication. The medication controls the seizures, maybe mostly, but there's some side effects. Person thinks they're not a candidate, but really, in many cases, we can operate in that particular area and cure the person by, let's say, removing a low-grade tumor removing a cavernous malformation, which is vascular malformation. Okay. Once, um, once you've had one of these two categories, um, it's very important that you go through the epilepsy monitoring unit um, in a level three or four academic epilepsy center. You should get a high resolution MRI, video EEG, which is an inpatient stay where you have scalp EEG, video cameras on you 24 seven. Your medications are reduced and, and you have seizures and the physicians want you, the medical team wants you to have seizures so that these can be um, videoed and we can look at the scalp EEG at the same time. And I think this is honestly one of the other reasons why it takes a long time for people to get to surgery is no one wants to have a seizure. People typically do not like to come in and have to stay in the hospital until the point where you have a seizure. Um, but this is unfortunately um, still the best way we have to try to see what the brain looks like during a seizure, which is just very important information. And I've put in bold here, neurosurgical consultation, and I'm very biased because I'm a neurosurgeon. But one thing that we've always tried to do in our practice is to um, talk to the patient as early as possible in the process, as opposed to having the neurologist um, send the patient all the way at the end um, where a lot of time can be lost for a variety of reasons. One is because once all of this information is collected, patients presented an epilepsy surgery conference. So this is multidisciplinary conference. Sometimes there's some other imaging studies that are needed, MAG or PET scan, for instance. And then we typically have uh, these categories that people can fall into, what's called a focal seizure, where all the data lines up for a particular spot or region in the brain. And one of the pieces of information that lines up is what happens to the person during the seizure or what's called their, the semiology. So what it looks like, what the person feels. 
You can also have a semiology of a focal seizure. So a seizure looks like it's the same all the time, but the non-invasive data really does not line up. And then you can have a type of epilepsy, which very clearly looks what we call multifocal or is generalized. Again, my bias here, but at this point, I think it's appropriate for people to talk to a surgeon about potential options so they can understand what's, what's coming next. And the group makes a you know, consensus recommendation about this. And here are the options. So this, it used to be this was the only thing we could do, resection surgery. So that means remove the part of the brain where we think the seizures are starting. You can also do something now called laser thermal ablation, which is minimally invasive surgery that we do in intraoperative MRI or an MRI scanner where um, the seizure onset area can essentially be heated up to the point that it does not survive. Um, or we might have to do intracranial monitoring first because we don't have enough information from the non-invasive studies to make a recommendation about something that's really gonna work. Um, and this is another reason that people get held up because not everyone is in, uh, you know, receives care in a medical center that can do intracranial monitoring. So this is putting electrodes in the brain, having someone come back through the epilepsy monitoring unit for an inpatient stay and recording directly from the brain during a seizure. And if you can think about, well, why do we need to do this? You can think of scalp EEG as like an old television set from the 1960s. And you can watch an event, you know, on TV, sports game, some type, and you kind of see what's happening. You can see someone scored, you can see a little bit, but you can't really see the, the details are a little grainy. In some cases, we need to see exactly where the seizure is coming from. And so we need to go to high def TV, which is intracranial monitoring or recording directly from the, from the brain. There are different ways to do that. The outcome after that could still be resection surgery or ablation, or it could be neuromodulation, and we have responsive neurostimulation, we have deep brain simulation, these are brain simulation devices. And really, even though this group, multifocal and generalized, are off-label, um, we have used these uh, neuromodulation devices in these cases. VNS is typically reserved for multifocal or generalized epilepsy, even though it's approved for focal epilepsy. In our practice, this has tended to be a um, last resort. That doesn't mean it's a bad option. It just means that our philosophy has been to, to try to treat in the brain first. But there's some, there um, can be many reasons why we might go to vagal nerve stimulation. So we're going to get down to talking about DBS here uh, because that's why I was asking. Uh, Dr. Richardson, because you mentioned the VNS, there was one comment from Sarah Specht. Will it work better than VNS if her son is having many, many myoclonics? She has a thousand myoclonics down here with the VNS, all, although they're brief ones. They do not know where, where his are coming from because they are deep in the brain. Some seizures cause bradycardia that has gone down as low as 19 with oxygen. Um, and going down to 40, I think, post-dictal. Will, will this help with all of that? So just keep that in your mind. That's a, that's a lot. <laughs> no, that's a lot. And I would just say um, it's possible and it's hard to say, you know, so in some cases, um, you know, I get patients um, referred to see me or often patients refer themselves um, and come see me in clinic and they'll say, uh, we were told that there was nothing else to do because of such and such. And in some cases that is true. In other cases, it's just not, and it's not, um, it's hard to know um, without really looking at the details of the case. That would include imaging, um, the video EEG study. Um, there are a number, you know, basically all the things on this page need to be considered to answer the question that was asked. So I'd say my, mm -hmm. general, my general response is that, you know, anyone who's not sure whether the recommendation they've gotten about um, whether they've maxed out on what they can do about epilepsy treatment um, should seek a second opinion at a major academic center. Uh, there's nothing ever wrong with getting another opinion. All right, let's talk about surgical modalities. We've already covered this and um, Patrick helped, uh, helped introduce this concept. So this, to this day, is still the best option that we have for people with epilepsy. Now, 
only people with temporal lobe epilepsy qualify for this type of surgery. And this looks very drastic and scary, um, it granted. But you would be quite surprised to know that we can remove this much of the temporal lobe, and Patrick is a good example, and the person can be exactly the same in terms of their personality and intelligence. On average, depending on which side this is done, the language dominant or not the language dominant side, there can be some measures in neuropsychological evaluation that do get worse, and some of these things would be noticeable by the patient, but there are other things that can improve. People generally tend to think that they feel like their brain is working better, they feel better if they're not having seizures, so if we can make seizures go away. So with this surgery, about two-thirds of people are seizure-free at a year, up to 80 or 90 percent can be seizure-free at a year, depending on their um, preoperative data. Out to 10 years, it drops just below half of people who are still seizure-free. So that means that um, there's something else going on in the circuit um, of those people who eventually have seizures after this operation, even though sometimes it's many years down the road. Um, so it used to be that doing, you know, identifying the seizure focus and maybe it would be in the frontal lobe or somewhere else and then removing the tissue was the only thing that we could do, but that's no longer the case. Well, here's something else we can do. This is what laser ablation looks like, so um, kind of hard to see, but this outline, the blue outline is from software that we use in this surgery to um, determine the area that's heated. And then this is a post-op scan about one month later, and this area that's outlined in white is the hippocampus and it has been ablated, which means lesioned or heated to the point that it should not function anymore. And this is a patient who had seizures recorded to be coming from the hippocampus, which you, this is the temporal lobe. This is a slice through someone's um, brain as if they are looking at us. This is a side view over here on the bottom left, and this is top left is what's called an axial view. So that's a slice uh, kind of like this, and then looking up. But this one on the right is, is like you're looking at the person. Okay, so it just gives you, and so just as a comparison, um, let's go back to here. We don't have to do this surgery um, anymore um, in people who have seizures recorded to be coming from the hippocampus. Um, as a first line treatment, we can try this, which is more minimally invasive, uh, where basically a probe comes into the back of the brain. Um, and heats the tissue and person go home the same day. If this doesn't work, then in some cases we'll go to um, temporal lobectomy or we might go to a neuromodulation device um, at that point. This device called RNS, it's responsive neurostimulation. So there are electrodes that go in the brain. They can potentially record when a seizure starts and then stimulate. This device is all implanted um, in the head. And then this is DBS. So this is what we're going to spend most of the time talking about. So that here, in this case, the pulse generator is down the chest. And the leads are in part of the brain called the thalamus, uh, which is widely um, a deeper part of the brain that's widely connected to cortical areas. And the idea with this therapy is that it cycles on and off um, and disrupts the, the seizure network in some way. We don't fully understand how this works, um, but DBS has been now used for a variety of different neurologic conditions. And there's a, a general thought that it works by disrupting pathological or you know, abnormal um, uh, synchronization of brain circuits, um, but it allows normal functions to proceed. So this is not new. Um, there have been over two decades of um, innovation and, and use of DBS. So this was first used in movement disorder patients, people with um, tremor um, back in the late 80s. Uh, it was FDA approved about a decade later uh, in the United States. Um, first approved for essential tremor and then Parkinson's disease. It's also approved um, for obsessive compulsive disorder and dystonia, which is another movement disorder. Um, used to be that if you had one of these devices, you couldn't get an MRI. Um, that changed to being able to get an MRI um, in the head and now you can get one the full body MRI. Um, many of these devices have now been implanted uh, worldwide. Um, and then 
uh, which is now almost a couple of years uh, in the United States, which lagged behind Europe, by the way, by about two or three years, uh, was approval of DBS, deep brain simulation for epilepsy um, in the US. And that was on um, top of a, a, a lot of clinical data um, supporting its, its utility, its efficacy, which we'll talk about. Um, so, you know, returning to the idea of understanding the seizure network, um, this is an evolving concept, um, but one that um, uh, is, is frankly not well understood out in community neurology practices or certainly community practices in general, but um, it's really gaining a lot of um, prevalence uh, in the academic centers, which is thinking about the, the epilepsy circuit and understanding that um, these regions in the brain, like the thalamus, that are connected to the areas that we think actually generate the seizure, which is the, the cortical areas, you know, the, these outer gray matter areas, these inner deep gray structures, gray matter structures, including the thalamus, are part, important node of a circuit where normal cognitive information passes through, uh, but also seizure activity passes through. So the thalamus can be a gatekeeper from information going from one part of the brain to the other, and also a gatekeeper for seizures passing through the brain. So the idea is that by interrupting traffic coming through this area can potentially dramatically um, reduce the seizure activity in the circuit. This is just a cartoon of the FDA approved target for DBS, which is the anterior nucleus of the thalamus that happens to be most widely connected to these blue areas which include the temporal lobe, and here's the hippocampus, and here's the frontal lobe. So this, the left-hand side's the front. If you had someone's eyeballs, it'd be right about here. Um, and you see the back of the brain's not really well connected uh, to the anterior thalamus. That is okay for people where we think the, you know, these other parts of the brain are really the um, problem part of the circuit because even though this is the FDA approved target, we don't have to put it here in everybody. And we try to be thoughtful about this and, and think about um, other parts of the thalamus um, where there is data um, for implantations that would um, affect these other cortical areas in the brain. All right, so does this work? And you know, is this gonna work better than DNS and these types of questions? Um, and do I have a slide? Let me just, so I don't forget to answer it. The question of, can you do basically any of this stuff uh, if you already have a VNS? The answer is yes. And all of these things, um, the, the brain simulation devices, well, let me put it this way. VNS may work uh, by doing some part of what the brain simulation devices do. We think the brain simulation devices would do it better. So just if VNS hasn't worked, that does not mean that any of these other things haven't worked. And I have one point also to make about VNS. Um, this isn't obviously the case with everybody that has one, but there are many people, in my opinion, who have um, maybe received VNS you know, years ago when people thought that was the best option. Um, and uh, if they were evaluated today, maybe it would you know, not be um, considered the best option. These people are all candidates for a re-evaluation you know, with modern kind of principles applied to see if there's anything better that can be done. So this is, what the, this is data from Medtronic's um, clinical trial. They did have patients that tried, this goes out to seven years, that's a long follow-up. Um, there were people who didn't kind of report back what was happening, and so some assumptions were made about their seizure freedom, what's called the um, last observation carried forward. It means however they said they were doing it three years, that is carried forward if they didn't you know, respond at six years to the to a survey about how they were doing. But what you see, this is median total seizure frequency percent change or reduction from baseline. Median is the middle number. You take all of the, the people and you look at what was the, the kind of middle number that people had. It was in the 70% seizure frequency reduction. Now, but here's the thing. Look how this happened. It started at one year. It was only 40%. You know, what we say about BNS is it works for about half the people that get it can get maybe a 50% reduction. So this beats VNS, um, but it takes time. 
And one of the things that we're trying to understand uh, better is how to maybe put this in the right spot or use it in the right people so that um, you get a 70% reduction at one or two years and not at seven years. But another take home message is, is um, the, the, these brain modulation therapies are affecting the background circuitry of the seizure network and they have a cumulative effect over time. And so I guess the pessimistic view of this would be, ah, oh, it takes this long to work, this stinks. Optimistic view would be, it's still working, it keeps working, and it kind of keeps working better over time. Um, but that's just something to appreciate for sure. Um, here's just a different way of looking at it. Here's a responder way, 50% or greater reduction in seizures. Again, this just shows you the cumulative effect, uh, people who reach this point um, over time. Um, another thing I grabbed from a Medtronic slide, um, which just again shows these various numbers from the clinical trial. Um, I think this is important that um, when you talk about people who are having a lot of seizures, um, um, and a lot of seizures, by the way, is not defined by a number, it's defined by the effect on someone's quality of life and the extent to which it prevents them from doing what they want to do. So if you are prevented from what you want to do and you don't have a seizure for six months, even though you might not be completely cured, you know, that's a big deal. So almost 20% of people, you know, got to that point. We would like the number to be higher, um, but it's not bad um, when you consider um, that medications aren't, aren't doing anything. Uh, but not, that's not true. That medications are not, you know, reaching um, this level. And then they claim 84% patient satisfaction rate you know, after seven years. So that you can maybe take that to read that at least 80% of people would do it again um, out at seven years. Um, let's see. All right. So let's, um, you know, again, happy to take questions anytime. This may be my last uh, kind of summary um, slide here where we'll talk about how the surgery itself is done. Um, so we'll, we now can do this asleep under general anesthesia. So if you may have seen deep brain simulation uh, videos or something like this online for movement disorders, people are often awake. We don't have to do it awake. Sometimes we do it awake. Sometimes we do it asleep. In this case, we do not need to do it awake. And actually, it's better to do it asleep in an MRI scanner. So using an intraoperative MRI, we have one at MGH. Other places have one um, as well where you can see the target and you can very specifically put the um, lead there in the thalamus uh, for DBS. Um, patients tend to go home the next day. Um, let's talk about risk of surgery because I don't have that in here. I'm just uh, realizing. So the risk is about 1% of having bleeding in the brain by passing the probe through. That would be a stroke, you know, causing bleeding in the brain. Um, the chance that that causes a true lifelong disability is even lower. Um, so that risk is not zero. And if you're in the 1% of person who has a, a brain bleed from doing the operation, that's obviously a huge deal to you. Most people, this will be something they can have a pretty good recovery from and in, after inpatient rehab. Um, the risk that's more likely to happen to the average person is the chance of infection. So that risk is about 5%. Uh, which again is pretty low, but anytime we put a device in the body, there's a chance it can get infected. Sometimes we might have to take it out. We can put it back in if need be. Um, not if need be, but that would be if the patient you know, wants it back in because we know the need is there. Um, and that's really it. The chance of DBS um, in the thalamus changing someone's cognition or mood is uh, probably not zero, but it's... Um, you know, it's close. If you look at the clinical trial data, um, if anything, we think these issues are more likely to improve, especially if the seizure rate is going down. Um, let's see. So after that initial brain surgery, um, the device is not yet on or connected. We typically bring people back about two weeks later. Um, if they're traveling from a really far distance, we might keep them in the hospital and do it in the same um, same admission to implant the connector wires and the pulse generator in the chest. About two weeks later, they come back to have the sutures removed and to have the device turned on. Um, and then the follow-up after that is about the same 
um, sort of frequency that you would follow up with your neurologist for medication adjustment and for adjusting the device. Um, this can be used in children. It's not FDA approved. It might be a fight with the insurance company. This is somewhat controversial because there are people who reasonably believe that you should not do things until they are FDA approved, um, unless they're in a clinical trial. Um, our approach has been to really think about this from the patient's point of view and to have a team approach to thinking about whether these devices can be used for indications uh, for which they're not FDA approved. So same thing for generalized epilepsy. We have used these devices in generalized epilepsy, in some cases with very good results. Um, there are various plans um, to do clinical trials. Again, this is something that may not be approved by someone's insurance, but um, in cases where uh, the academic team, has, clinical team has felt that it's reasonable to move forward, we can um, try to do that. Uh, and I think that's it. So hopefully that um, didn't take up too much of everyone's time. Uh, no, not at all, Dr. Richardson. That was That was really, we have plenty of time for questions. So if you raise your hand, I'll unmute you for questions, or if you have something that you want to type in the question box, I'll monitor that as well. Let me see if anybody has their hand raised. I do not. I think it's because you did such an excellent job of answering their questions that were placed in there earlier. Well, we had so many good ones, and I'm, let me just look over my notes. I think, oh, you know, Shonda uh, mentioned this idea of, um, you know, influence of drug pharmaceutical companies um, and things that, you know, might be said um, about what's a gold standard or not. Um, and I think, you know, the, the answer to that is probably that um, it's always good to get another opinion um, in general. Yeah, we want to try medications first, but we want to be very, um, I mean, I guess the simplest way to put this is, it's, I think things work better when the clinicians try to put themselves in the shoes of the patients. Pharmaceutical companies, um, you know, and the device companies for that matter, uh, you know, that's that's not always their um, goal. That should always be the first time that they're going to um, that's okay. Uh, Sarah Specht, I'm going to unmute you so you can ask your question. Go ahead, you are unmuted. Is there a uh, percentage of the reduction of seizures for those that are seizing um, a huge amount? So my son is like 95, he was originally 95% during the day, constant during his sleep. Um, the VNS helped with a reduction of 80%, but now I am seeing myoclonics coming back to be about a thousand during the day. Wow. Um, you know, I um, I don't know the answer um, for your son in particular. I'd say the the way to start would be to um, have a, a another video EEG study in the epilepsy monitoring unit to try to characterize this uh, as well as possible. Um, yeah, because that's a, that's a lot of Great. Thank you. Let me see if anybody else has their hand raised. Uh, let's see. Oh, I do. I see Dana Jackson. You are unmuted. Oh, you're self-muted. You have to unmute yourself, Dana. There we go. Okay, um, Dana, so go ahead. My daughter is nine years old, and we recently had a stay at Boston Children's um, for a phase one evaluation. Um, and so they pretty much found that her seizures were starting on both sides of the brain and just traveling all over. Um, and then also having absent seizures. So um, kind of wondering how this may um, be a help for her um, as well as maybe introducing VNS to it or keto, but uh, definitely interested in this, but um, I guess the whole surgery aspect of course is scary, but 
um, I guess just yeah, not knowing I and could slide the rat right into their traps. Yeah. Um, I hear what you're saying. So, um, especially in people who are younger, you know, VNS is often used first because obviously it's not a brain surgery. So I think in terms of whether, um, you know, one would consider DBS um, instead of VNS, it really depends on the type of type of seizure and um, your description of having it, um, you know, active on both sides of the brain, quickly traversing from one side to the other. Um, it's hard to comment on that without knowing the specifics and seeing her EEG, for instance, and looking at the semiology, you know, what happened to her during this seizure. Um, so I'd say it's certainly something reasonable to, um, you know, to think about, but it's, it's hard to answer the question without knowing the specifics of her case where we'd really have to look at the MRI and look at the, the EEG. The reason for that is um, if it was possible to define the um, epilepsy type a little more specifically in terms of the brain region involved. Um, one might be able to make a case that brain stimulation would have a better work that is, you know, hard to hard to say. Okay. I don't know if you can. Uh, we have some extra noise from somewhere, but I don't know from where. It might be me. So let me just quickly ask this question and then I'll mute myself. Uh, this person, Joy, says my 16-year-old son with Dell GS is on his second BNS and we don't think it's helping. He's still on five meds and has two-thirds of a corpus callosotomy. Would you recommend removing the VNS and trying deep brain stimulation? They're very leery of having too much hardware. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, I would say I wouldn't remove the VNS um, unless it was really proven that it wasn't doing anything because we'd hate to um, take something out uh, that was, you know, contributing in any way to tamping down the seizures. Um, yes, it's certainly reasonable to consider doing DBS um, on top of this, even though, you know, he's had the corpus callosotomy and he's had um, the VNS. If these aren't working, you know, they're not working. Um, in terms of, you know, having too much hardware, I do understand that concern and just it's too much to deal with. Um, So I guess I would say it's all on the table for what the potential options are, but I would, um, unless it could really be shown like the, the battery died and wasn't replaced and it didn't make any difference, um, or, you know, in conjunction with their epilepsy neurologist, they'd turn it off to, um, to see whether it made, that made any difference. You know, only in cases like that where we really know the VNS isn't doing anything do we take it out, but we certainly can take it out. Um, but it seems to me in this case, if DBS were to be recommended, you know, by um, a clinical epilepsy team that um, you'd want to try that and try to have some better improvement, then potentially maybe turn the VNS off and see if, uh, if there was not worsening, then you might know it's safe to get the device out. Okay, great. Now, Karen Sweet has three questions. So she asks, does DBS affect memory? And then um, her second, do you want to go one by one? Sure. No, that's an easy one. So I'll just take that one so I don't forget it. The answer is no. Okay, great. Uh, if the implementation of the DBS is not successful, can it be removed? Yes. Okay, that's easy. Now, having said and, that, I never so let me just I'll, I'll i'll add one thing to that is now we have a lot more experience doing dbs um, and putting devices in movement disorder patients i've never had to take one out of an epilepsy patient but also in all the dbs i've done for movement disorders i have you know um i don't do everything perfectly and i've had electrodes that did not end up in the right spot where we move them and we're talking about millimeters but I've never taken, no one has ever asked me to take out their DBS device because it wasn't doing anything. Sorry, I'm muting and unmuting myself too. Um, let me see. 
Someone else, Hillary Winston, is asking if this could work on a Dravet patient. Um, you know, um, quite possible. If you look through the literature um, for uh, genetic epilepsies and you see what people have done with neuromodulation, there's really a, um, you know, it's a mixed bag. So um, it is hard to say, and this hasn't really been um, used, but the general response I have to this type of question is if someone's quality of life is not good because the seizures are not controlled and the, the medical options are, you know, all the realistic options have been exhausted, then it's completely reasonable to think about neuromodulation of some type. I am just trying to read up and down the panel to make sure I'm not missing any. Bear with me, Dr. Richardson and everyone. Um, oh, you know, someone asked, uh, I'm just looking at this too, Susan, about insurance uh, before. Yes. And you know, in the, in the insurance should never be denied for epilepsy surgery. That's FDA approved. Some of these things we're talking about, use in generalized epilepsy or use in pediatrics those could be turned down you know, legitimately because they are not FDA approved. Everything else though, it should never be turned down. I mean, these things are covered, you know, temporal lobe surgery, now DBS. Now, people might encounter a problem where they're initially turned down for DBS because it's a relatively new indication, but ultimately that the insurance company should be defeated um, if that happens. So for the most part, insurance should not be an issue. Although I know sometimes it is. Thank you. What about off-label, though? Wouldn't it always be an issue if it was off-label or for a child? It's not always an issue. Um, it's often, you know, if not usually an issue. However, what we tend to do is just go through the appeal process. And not every case, but many cases, we can uh, convince the insurance company through an appeal process. Okay, so we have, uh, Dana has his hand raised, so I'm gonna, un he's, Dana, go ahead and unmute yourself. Sorry, I never uh, took it down. I'm, I'm all set with questions. Okay, thank you. Then I have one thank more you. written question. Uh, Sarah Specht asked, does small brain atrophy due to damage from whatever reason change the response for allowing the DBS working effectively? Um, no, at least not that we know of. You know, there are a lot of people with um, epilepsy have um, an area of cortical atrophy or even a broad area of cortical atrophy. Um, and, and, and so do a lot of other people, by the way, you know, if someone who's used to looking at a lot of different MRIs, you'd be surprised who has some, some atrophy, you know, in, in the brain. So um, short answer is no, that's not a reason um, not to consider this. Okay, so, and then she asks, let's see, if the VNS has reduced seizures by 80 to 90%, originally they were constant during sleep, and 95% of the day with the first diagnosis of um, do dozers, I, I never know how to say, it looks like deuce in English, um, and now LGS, so she's asking, um, the VNS has reduced them, but he's still not seizure free. Right, it's hard to say. You know, there's just not a lot of experience using DBS in this type of case. So, you know, you ask most people that question, they would say, well, why aren't you happy with your 80% reduction for VNS? Um, and your answer is that you're the parent of the child who's still having seizures. So short answer is there's not a lot of experience. Um, but another way to look at it is that the brain has responded to electrical stimulation therapy. In the case of VNS, it's indirect. Uh, you know, traveling up through the vagal nerve and then just kind of broadly affecting the brain through the brainstem. Um, but I would consider it a good sign that there has been a response to stimulation. And this is an unknown, the extent to which these therapies can be combined. Uh, but there's certainly anecdotal evidence that in combination they can work. And I think we'll be seeing more and more of people using all types of epilepsy surgery in combination to try to um, reduce the 
abnormal part of the seizure circuitry as much as possible. And again, this is this is a newer way of thinking. The traditional way of thinking is you get a workup, the group comes up with one thing, you try it, and if it doesn't work, everyone says, well, we did the best we can. And I think we're just in a, you know, the field has evolved um, to the point where we should really be considering using different treatments um, in the same patient. It doesn't mean that we should just do this willy-nilly, you know, on everyone, but I think it's important to be thoughtful about it. Shannon has her hand raised. Let me unmute her. Shannon, go ahead. You are unmuted. Yeah. Um, when you consider gray matter being in multiple portions of the brain, so frontal lobe, temporal lobe, uh, you know, many parts of the brain, do you see the DBS being a device that could help any of that once we know that the gray matter is causing the seizures? Um, yes, and I would say in general, the answer is yes, because DBS works in these structures that are connected to the different cortical areas. Um, if you're talking about um, spots of gray matter that shouldn't, that are, you know, kind of out of place in these different areas as opposed to, you know, where they should be normally in the brain, um, the yeah, answer is also... Be. Like like heterotopias is a word. Yeah, that's heterotopias used. and abnormal lesions. Yeah, definitely. We have had success um, doing this. Okay, thank you. Sure. Keep forgetting to unmute myself. Anyone else have any questions? Um, I don't see any other hands. Well then, Dr. Richardson, I'm going to thank you so much for having this be such a uh, interactive presentation and very informative. Uh, people living with seizures, as you know, they want choices, uh, and and I firmly believe that people shouldn't settle until their seizures are under control. So, thank you so so much for joining us this evening, and thank you also for being on the front line of this whole crazy pandemic. These are crazy days. Yeah, it's crazy. And um, yeah, well, thank you. And I thank everyone for sharing their questions and personal experience. And I learn something every time, you know, um, talk to someone with epilepsy. So thank you all. Okay, well, at this point, we're going to end the webinar. And I thank you all for attending. And I can't thank Dr. Richardson enough for his time as well. And I'll thank uh, Medtronics for facilitating this and making it happen. So thank you all. Have a wonderful evening. Please stay healthy. Keep your social distance so we can all get through this. Thank you very much and good evening. Thank you.